So, all right, thank you for every, everyone for coming to um, uh, another talk in our series of ISR Distinguished Speakers. I'm really excited here today to introduce uh, Tefik Bultan. Um, he is a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara uh, in the Computer Science Department. Uh, he works on software verification, uh, program analysis, um, uh, computer security, software engineering. Uh, he, um, he has uh, done a lot for the software engineering community in terms of uh, being one of the co-chairs at the top, uh, one of the co-chairs of the program committees in the top conferences in software engineering, including ICSI, FSC, and a ASC. Uh, he's been a general chair at another top conference, ISTA. He's been an associate editor at TSE and TOSUM, top journals in software engineering. He's also received um, uh, notable awards such as uh, the NATO Science Fellowship, um, uh, the NSF Career Award, uh, uh, Graduate Mentoring Awards, and um, he's also um, an ACM Distinguished Scientist. And so uh, uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to have uh, Tefik here. And so um, I'll give him the floor so he can talk to us about software, logic, and automata, automating dependability of software. Well, thank you very much for inviting me um, to give this talk. Um, can I move, or is the microphone like just picking up from here? I mean, is, is it from here? So I like to move around. I'm wondering if it's going to be hard to hear if I move around, but uh, it's, it's okay. It's okay. I'll, just, uh, I'll be less mobile. Um, so yeah, when um, Josh asked me to give this talk, I, I had a set of slides. I um, already gave a talk, but I wasn't happy with it and kind of wanted to add some stuff around it. And I hope you enjoy it. We'll see. <laughs> so um, well, I'm at UCSB, that's my office is somewhere there. Uh, uh, and uh, this is the group of uh, researchers, my PhD and uh, postdocs and alumni and current members. And um, I also had worked with some undergraduate students, but couldn't fit them all in the slide. But uh, so uh, all the research I'm going to talk about as part of this talk is with all these uh, wonderful people who I uh, worked with. Um, so I want to start with the. Uh, Mark Andreessen quote that software is eating the world. Um, I mean, I, I think as computer scientists, we know this, and software engineers, we know this, but it's good to repeat to other disciplines too because people, you know, if you read newspaper, they say, oh, technology, you know, technology. It's not technology, it's computing. So it's not, <laughs> it's software. So when they say technology, new technology, it's always computing. Computing is always there. Uh, it's really changing the world, so it is, you know, it's a, having a huge impact, and um, and software is crucial, right? Anything about computing, uh, so it is a very important thing to study. So that's what I want to start with, and um, you know, since software is eating the world, software engineering is very important. So uh, a systematic, disciplined, quantifiable approach to the production and maintenance of software. So it's a very important topic, and. Uh, I was, when I taught software engineering last quarter, I was very happy to start with the slide that software engineering is 50 years old uh, because it was 1968 um, with the NATO conference that I think that most people consider as the origin of the uh, discipline. And if you are kind of wondering like how that looks like 50 year old, uh, you can look at me. I'm exactly <laughs> as old as software engineering. I was born in 1968, so it's kind of graying uh, hair and you know hair loss and <laughs> some somewhere you know. So, um, but you know it's still alive. <laughs> so and this was so uh, you know it's it was it started to solve uh, this software crisis you know the software crisis that uh, the computer scientists at the time observed that um, you know building large software systems is difficult so we gotta kind of look at this problem carefully um, now I'm going to in the first part of the talk I'm going to talk about a bunch of papers and um, uh, to kind of get to the view uh, vision the research vision that I have been pursuing but uh, the first paper I want to start with is comes quarter century after the original, and many of you probably know about this stuff, but uh, quarter century after the uh, NATO conference on software engineering, 
1994, there was this paper in Scientific American by White Gibbs saying that software is chronic crisis with the observ observation that despite 50 years of progress, I assume this 50 years is not 50 years of software engineering progress, but 50 years of programming, I assume, starting with the uh, you know, uh, 40s with the original computer, uh, computers, uh, the first computers. The software industry remains uh, you know, decades short of mature engineering discipline need to meet the demands of an information age society. So in, and so that time, software engineering was still not doing so well. Uh, and this is the time, actually, I was, uh, I started working on software engineering. <laughs> so I realized that, hey, there's some, this is a good area to work on. Uh, no, I wasn't familiar with this paper. Uh, I learned about it probably a decade later. Um, but so it is a little bit uh, discouraging that, um, uh, you know, this problem is still there. Now, I want to give a personal note. Another quarter century later, uh, I am showing you this photo. This is the photo of my uh, navigation system. When I was driving last night, this is how the navigation system in my car looks like. And I'm not making this up. And it rebooted three times when I was driving <laughs> down here. And I, I seriously was, I mean, I was looking at it. Like, luckily, it wasn't on auto, autopilot. I was looking, and it was, I was getting the you know, directions through my system. And it rebooted three times. Um, so this is concerning. <laughs> I mean, of course, it's not tied to my auto brake system or whatever, but it is, it is not encouraging to see this thing just reboot three times while I'm driving, especially when we're talking about you know, self-driving cars. So software <laughs> dependability problem is still strong and it's still here. And uh, yeah, you know, so large software systems do not provide the desired functionality, take too long to build, cost too much to build, require too much resources, cannot evolve, meet uh, changing needs. So now, as a software engineering researcher, you may say, you know, what's happening? Like 50 years ago, they stated this problem, you know, 50 years of software engineering research, are we going in circles? So I'm an optimist. I definitely do not think we are going in circles. Uh, there's definitely progress. And I'm, I'll give you one line of research progress that I see and where it started and, you know, talk about a bunch of um, papers. Then I'll get to my research and we'll see how much, how we'll do on time. But um, so in my research uh, uh, kind of vision, um, I'm interested in software dependability in general, and I look at it very, uh, you know, uh, wide view of it, safety, security, reliability, availability, maintainability, any dependability problem I'm interested in. Um, so that's the key problem. I see it as a key problem in software engineering research, and my research interests are automating it somehow. I want to do automatically, somehow automate it. And I have a soft spot for logic and automated logic sol solvers, and I want to use automated logic solvers and uh, to solve this problem. You can have other techniques, but that's you know one area that I worked a lot is that. And um, so now, interestingly, this goes way back. I'll just mention a few papers that you may know, uh, but you know, this was Floyd's paper from uh, 1967 about assigning meaning to programs. So before Software Engineering Conference, the concept that we can take software and kind of assign a logic meaning to it, like interpret it as a logic formula, and therefore do reasoning about the program using logic reasoning. So that's an old idea. And if you actually go back, this logic software connection is always there. First of all, that's like computation can be represented as logic. But the foundation of computing, which was, I guess you can take one of the founding papers, Turing's paper on um, Turing machines, basically, the, the paper that defines pure Turing machines. Why did he do that? Well, he was looking for, he was motivated by a logic problem. The logic problem was, is there an algorithm that takes as input a statement of a first order logic and determines if it's provable using axioms and rules of inference? So he wanted to investigate this problem. While he was investigating this problem, he actually created the most commonly used theoretical model for computing. So logic you know, was at the origins of computation. So this logic software, logic computation co uh, connection is very early. So using logic to reason about programs, Floyd's paper I mentioned, but then, as you know, our logic paper by Tony Hoare, you know, providing a logic basis for uh, program reasoning. 
weakest preconditions by Dijkstra, you know, these papers. And so these concepts, like we can reason about uh, programs using logic, became common, and this is like 70s. And actually, you had textbooks, for this famous one, for example, by David Gries, about how to write software, how to reason about programs manually using logic. And, and for a while, the idea was that this is how you would write um, software. You know, when you are writing your programs, you would reason about them using logic and prove properties about it. Now here's the thing, manual logic reasoning doesn't scale, doesn't work. Because writing manual proofs for proving correctness of programs is not easier than writing correct programs. So you can make errors in your logic reasoning. So manual approach doesn't work. So then, I mean, that is, you know, if you think it works, <laughs> we can continue, I mean, it's fine, but uh, we haven't seen success in that. Uh, so it was tried and it, didn't, it seems like it doesn't work. So, but if we can automate the logic reasoning, now maybe we can have, you know, something to reason about software. So that's the question. So can we automate uh, this connection? Can we automate the um, software logic connection? So one thing is you can actually, rather than manually kind of assigning meanings to programs, you can actually extract constraints about the program behavior, logic constraints, using well-known techniques now. It's very fashionable nowadays too, but it goes back all the way to the 1970s, symbolic execution, using these techniques that extract actually constraints about the program behavior automatically, right? So interpret the program as a logic, you know, um, some assign some logic meaning to a program. And later on, now model checking is more complicated, but model checking also gives you ways of going from some software specification to logic. It has its own different ways, uh, you know, that involves many things, but at, at its core, you can actually also, it shows you the connection between software and logic. And um, so this is all great. So we can translate automatic the software to logic. Now, um, but can we do automated logic reason? And this is another challenging issue, right? So can we do that? And first, let's start with the depressing results. One is, well, it's very difficult. So if you pick the simplest logic that you can, which could be just Boolean logic, and we know the well-known uh, foundations of you know, complexity theory about MP completeness results that satisfiability problem is very difficult because we know that if you can show that efficiently, solve that efficiently, there are many other difficult problems that people couldn't find ways to solve efficiently will be solved efficiently too. So, um, so you know, the general belief is that we will never be able to solve that in polynomial time. It's going to be always expensive in the worst case. So that's one, uh, you know, discouraging result because it's a very simple logic. It's building logic. Now, if you go actually a little bit more, you go even before computing started, if you look at arithmetic, which basically don't just have Boolean logic, throw in integers there, and throw in some arithmetic addition multiplication, now try to prove things about that, well, that apparently becomes undecidable and uncomputable if you look at both Gödel's and Turing's results. So you can't automate it. So you cannot automate logic reasoning at a certain level. So, so this is the, that's a you know, depressing story. But good news, so what do we do? Give up efficiency on all inputs. So don't try to do it efficiently for every input. And use heuristics. So do your best and give up the hope that in the worst case it's going to be efficient. It's not going to be efficient in the worst case. So if you do that, people develop techniques. There is famous DPLL procedure. There is a famous implementation of impactful implementation of it in Shaf. And this is, was the, um, when this research really area started heating up, I remember, you know, in two early, late 90s, early 2000. Um, and, um, and there's another work you may or may not know, but uh, Omega a test by Bill Pugh that I used during my PhD thesis a uh, long time ago um, for linear arithmetic constraints, for uh, solving linear arithmetic constraints efficiently. And so people have developed basically heuristics for solving logic problems efficiently, uh, not worst case efficiently. Worst case still is bad, exponential complexity, but for a lot of experiments they seem to perform well 
for constraints we see in you know, real world problems. And the next step of that, well, you have all these you know, heuristic logic solvers. Can you combine them? And that's the last step of you know, this, uh, this line of research I will mention. And satisfiable to modular theory solvers, which basically com uh, combine uh, specialized logic solvers using uh, some general uh, heuristics for combination of decision procedures and you know the famous uh, now uh, very widely used uh, implementation of that is Z3. And uh, so automation of logic solvers actually you know came a long way starting from its origin. So it's definitely no circular thing going on here actually. There is progress. And, uh, and this, uh, you know, Z3 now, you know, a lot of software engineering papers you read, you'll see that, you know, they're using uh, this technology and it's uh, having uh, a combination of this technology with like symbolic execution did have huge impact, right? And we are seeing progress. So, so now <laughs> to summarize, uh, what we have is, what I tried to convince you is that we have the hammer, all right? So automated logic solvers is the hammer we have and and I tried to argue with you that this hammer we have is actually very intimately connected to the problem we have, which is the software. But when you get to the real world, this is what happens, all right? So I get my software dependability problem, and it turns out that that's a screw, actually. Now I need a screwdriver, and uh, that's the best I can find. <laughs> it's a screw, and then what I have here is actually a hammer, and uh, I, I, I don't need, you know, that's not really working. I'm going to hammer the screw, but it's not going to be a good result. So, so, uh, so, so this is this is this is typically what it is. And I have worked on both sides of this problem. So I tried to, you know, get this hammer kind of bigger and stuff. <laughs> and also worked on this side of the problem, tried to shape the screw to fit that. But um, and I, I and there are not just there is not just one screw. There is a lot of problems that we need to solve, and these are just the ones that I personally worked on. I worked on requirements, specifications, concurrency, dynamic data structures. I worked on web services, uh, web choreography, web applications, software models, access control, string manipulation, security. There are all and all these problems have different little things in them that make them unique. And if you think that you know one logic solver is going to solve all of them, it is not just push button. It's not going to be push button. So it's you know there is you have to do some a lot actually a lot extra work to somehow get Z3 <laughs> to solve something meaningful about these things. So um, so and you know so we have a lot of screw you know a lot of problems a lot of things to solve and we also have a lot of hammers so that's the other thing I want to mention it's not just one logic solver so boolean soft solvers are very effective SMT solvers are also effective but you know some problems call for your boolean soft solvers now I have my own uh, things here I have I do automata based constraint solver uh, as part of my research and that is a different technique uh, it is sometimes better than uh, you know this SMT solvers for certain domains and uh, and I recently I'm working on actually model counting constraint solvers where we actually count the number of solutions to a given constraint. And you know, some problems you have may actually fit that. So, so there is a bunch of techniques there. And uh, I guess I'll say that my lab, this verification lab, a lot of the research we do goes like this. We take this problem, we transform it to a nail, <laughs> and match it with the appropriate hammer. So if I, if I wanted to summarize what we do, I, I, we do this. <laughs> so, and we have done this many times. And now looking at it, I can say that, ah, oh, this is what we were doing. So I will talk to you about a, a couple of the you know, three, actually, if I have time, I'll talk about some of them, um, some problems, how we transformed it to this. Of course, I mean, it's very, this, there's a lot of complication going on here, how you go from this to you know, solve with the uh, logic constraint solver. But this is the high level thing. And, and it does, there is progress. So, you know, when we focus on some problems, we can actually solve them uh, using this research agenda. So, um, by the way, if you have questions, I'm happy to take questions anytime. So, you can interrupt me. But so now I'm going to go over a little bit of these different uh, problems that we solved using logic solvers and give you some insight about those. Yeah? So, so for the dependency, is the version of above? I mean, we have new package, old package, and the, the other new and the other old, and they are not compatible. 
Uh, so for the problems that I'm talking about? Uh -huh. So no, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about class of problems, OK? So I'm not talking about different version of code, if that's what you mean. Uh -huh. I'm talking about, for example, when input validation, I'm talking about whole class of, I'm going to talk about now, uh -huh. whole class of problems about SQL injection, cross-site scripting, uh -huh. all are mainly input validation problems, uh -huh. which is very different than what I call access control problems. And access control problems in itself is a very interesting area. And they are different <coughs> things. And uh, you know, the approach you use, one, to translate it to some constraint solver. And the constraint solver you use for one of them may not be the same as the constraint solver you use for the other one. So that's, that's what I mean. So, um, so input validation one. So this is a problem that you know very um, motivated by security area. And here I'm showing, well, OK, so this is the percentage of computer security vulnerabilities that are related to what I would call input validation stuff, OK? And of all computer security vulnerabilities. Now, if you see that here, input validation is becoming more and more important. Why? Because people are writing web applications and, uh, and you know, just starting to write more and more web applications. And they don't know much about computer security issues. OK, so they are getting SQL injection, you know, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities all the time. And then there is some learning curve. And then people stay, start saying, hey, don't do that, right? Good, you know, pay attention to vulnerabilities. And it does decrease, so I think. Or maybe techniques also improve, right? But then it also stays a little bit like that. I mean, it's just, it just doesn't go to zero. So there is some still, this is an important problem. And if you look at, this is top web application vulner, uh, vulnerabilities, top three different years um, when we wrote this stuff. This was the most recent, 2013. But um, so the top uh, vulnerabilities always include, for example, injection flows and cross-site scripting, which are, again, vulnerabilities that relate to input validation. So when you give an input to, the, uh, to a web application, if you don't properly validate it, if you don't properly sanitize it, it can cause security vulnerabilities. So this is an important problem. Um, so I'll give you a very simple example. Um, so here's the PHP code. It gets user input here. So this is the user input. And it assigns it to a variable. And then it says echo some concatenation with some string constant, some con and then it basically echoes that string. Now, for the purposes of this example, assume that this echo function is actually sensitive in the sense that it can cause a cross-site scripting vulnerability which means basically some user enters some input. That input is stored on the web application side. And then when another user comes to the site and views that input, for example, it could be a blog post, blog post right? It can execute some comments in that other uh, user's uh, site. So it's cross-site scripting. So, so we want to make sure that this string that goes into echo function is actually properly sanitized. So now what people do is that, oh, OK, so an input that has an executable script in it, so this is bad input, right? So I'm asking for maybe some web address, and this is, person is giving me a script. So this is not good. This is a malicious user. And this is bad input. I don't want it. But I just assigned it to a variable, and it, flew, it went into a security sensitive function. So this is not good, and this is uh, a vulnerability. So people do taint analysis for this. Used to do so. You say, "Oh, user input is tainted. Why? Because I don't want to trust the user. So they they could be doing bad things, because I don't know all the users. And I say it's tainted. It gets assigned to my variable that is tainted, and that flows into a security sensitive function that is tainted. So tainted input flows into this function. So I say vulnerability. Great. So then." Um, well, so then the developer says, good, it is tainted. So I will write a sanitization statement. So the developer writes a statement that clears, cleans the input. How does the developer do that? Developer says, OK, in that variable that has the string that came from the user, replace, replace anything that doesn't match these things, which are OK with the empty string, meaning that delete everything that doesn't match the things I tell you, you know, uh, from that input, all right? So whatever should be in a web address, you know, I will delete everything, anything that doesn't match it. So that's what the developer does. So now what does the taint analysis? The taint analysis says the input is tainted. 
that variable is tainted. Oh, this input is tainted. Oh, the developer used the replace statement, so sanitized it. So now it's untainted, and it's good, right? That's what the analysis, taint analysis says. Great. Then we write this, run this code with our bad input. It comes in. So this left angle and right angle should trigger, uh, you know, this basically should be deleted, right? Because they are bad input. And it comes in here, but it passes. And bad input still flows into this output. Uh, to sense the function. So I wanted this sanitization to delete this left angle and right angle, all right? And it didn't delete it. Wh why? Because there was a bug in the code. So you see this dash, the developer used dash for two different meanings. Here, the developer used dash to mean it's a range, okay? Character range, starting with capital A and capital Z. Here, the developer used the dash to mean dash symbol, but forgot to escape it. So it ended up being the range of characters between dot and this add symbol. So it ended up including all the characters between that range, which also include the security sensitive characters like left angle and right angle. So the developer made a mistake. And so this code is still vulnerable, and this comes from a real application, actually. So therefore, um, you say, okay, so this input is not good, you know? Um, so this code is not good. Now you may say, okay, why don't you check if the input is correct immediately at the beginning? So if you have some expectations, say, you know, you don't want uh, to have this script input, this bad input in the input, just check for it. So let's check for it. So this input I'm showing you has left angle in it, but it doesn't have script in it, right? So it's like, it does have left angle, but maybe I'm using left angle for some benign purpose. It's actually really bad when I have left angle followed by script. So this one is not really what, it's not bad, okay? Because it, does, it, doesn't, have, it doesn't have script in it. So we pass this input, and this comes into this sanitization uh, function, and now that faulty sanitization function cleans it up and generates the, um, actually attack history. So, so what is the moral of the story? <laughs> Without really looking at your code behavior, I can't really figure out what's going on. So I need to somehow reason about your code. And, and this is where we actually developed a tool that will allow you to reason about your code, how your code manipulates strings. And, uh, and it will capture this string constraint, and it will, you know, from that actually we can find this kind of errors. So. Um, the um, tool we built actually um, what we generates what we call a vulnerability signature. So it will capture all inputs that may cause a vulnerability. And uh, so to do that, we still require a specification from you called an attack pattern, all right? And uh, so for example, in this case, it could be something like this, sigma star <coughs> followed by left angle script, sigma star. That is a specification that's not automatically generated. But once you give us that specification and, you know, based on the different security sensitive functions in your code, we will characterize all the inputs that may, you know, generate a um, string that will match the attack, uh, attack uh, specification, all right, and will flow into a security sensitive function. So for the little code I showed you, you know, the attack uh, vulnerable signature is something like this where I say, you know, you can insert any character that is deleted by the sanitization statement in between those things, and they will be deleted by the sanitization statement. So, so vulnerable signature is not that. Vulnerable signature is more complicated than what we have there. Um, so let me just uh, summarize the how we build it. I'm not going to, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff, uh, you know, we did for this, but I want to show you the high level uh, structure of this thing. Um, first, to do this tool, we did it for PHP and JavaScript. <coughs> first, we had an extraction step. And this goes to now, again, getting a nail out of the screw we have. So we have the problem. And first, I'm just interested in sanitization and validation. Uh, so I'm going to extract the code that just does that. So I'm going to track the input flow, the dependencies, and only track string manipulation functions. So I'm going to ignore everything else. I'm just going to extract that part of the code. 
that is much smaller than the full application. So I basically first focus. Once I focus on that part of the code, then I do the string analysis. And this string analysis part, you can consider its symbolic execution with string constraints. So you need a constraint solver that can handle string constraints, and we built that. We have an automata-based string constraint solver. And you know, so you need that, so it's kind of symbolic execution. And then after that, once we do that, we can actually, using vulnerability signature and our constraint uh, solver, solver, we can actually detect bugs. And we can even find, generate repairs, okay? Um, so a couple of slides where, um, yeah, I mean, I'm going to skip some stuff because there is like, depending on time, because I want to get to the other ones too. But at a high level, we use automata to characterize strings, uh, and we have automata-based string constraint solver. And um, we basically associate string expressions with automata and uh, use uh, constraint solving this way. Now, there's some details on this. This is actually something like what we generate. It looks uh, pretty messy when you try to print it out. But it's our automata encoding of some strings uh, accepted uh, you know, at some point in the program. But I want to get to one point. I'm going to skip all this. Um, I want to show you how we did repair, because I like this part a lot. So here is a very simple vulnerable signature. I just want to show as an example. Typically, they are not as simple as that. But assume that for some application, I generate the following vulnerable signature. And all it says is an automaton. It's your regular automaton. It starts this state. And it accepts anything that has a left angle in it. So the, all the, the only thing vulnerable to signature says is any input that contains left angle is bad. So that's that vulnerable signature. But what we could do with our technique was generate an automaton for any vulnerable signature. Okay, there are limitations, of course. Automata cannot capture all constraints. They are regular languages, right? So sometimes we over approximate, so it's not always precise. But it does generate a vulnerable signature that is an over approximation. Now the question becomes, can you repair it? So I know that any string accepted by this automaton is potentially dangerous. How can I repair my program? And we have a very simple solution to this, which is very nice. Well, if you delete all the characters that, you know, if you find a cut between the start state of the automaton and accepting states of the automaton, right? If you find a cut, <coughs> and delete all the characters on that cut, then you will ensure that any string accepted by this automaton will never reach your output, your uh, application, right? So this is our sanitization. And so this is kind of a very specific, you know, repair solution that comes from our automata-based analysis, and we can repair um, using, you know, the applications this way. So we implemented this, and we can actually automatically generate repairs uh, based on this. So we can find the thing, and then, for example, it will delete you know, if there is no left angle, it will just leave the input as it is. If there is a left angle, it will actually delete it and, uh, you know, uh, remove it. So um, I want to say a couple, two more things about this. One thing we learned is actually this, I just saw a tweet about this story. I'm, I want to talk about it. So I just saw somebody uh, post on Facebook saying the following. Um, Twitter... I don't know if this is right in check. Um, Twitter used machine learning for um, bug repair or something, or, or you know, bug detection, and and it removed all the code, <laughs> <laughs> which was a valid, <laughs> which was a valid repair. <laughs> it eliminated all the bugs. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, 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 so yes, so. You can, there's a very easy way to remove all the bugs. For input validation and sanitization, there's a very easy solution. Delete all the user input, and it's guaranteed to be safe, but it's not good. So the moral of the story is that the way you look at the problem is that it's not just there are bad inputs. You also have to say, that's the max policy, let's say. You know, anything outside of this max space of inputs I want is bad. You can say that, but if you don't have a min policy, where you say also, <coughs> these things should not be rejected. These are good. 
then actually you can just delete all the input. So you need to give that. If you, are wanna, if you want to automate it, you also have that sanity like min set, right? So we actually eventually did this, like a min policy and max policy, and we found bugs related to min policy. So for example, we found applications that reject an email when you use capital letters, right? Email address, so it's like, why are you rejecting the capital letters? I didn't know it was allowed or something. <laughs> so, 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 you know, so there's, there's things like that. So, so, I mean, you get basically bugs like under constraint, you know, allows bad input, but you also get bugs which is over constraint. It is actually rejecting uh, good uh, input. So, so anyway, so we did that. And one final thing about this work, um, we also did something where actually you can completely drop the specification where we actually do differential analysis. So, because typically when you go to like logic solvers, you think, oh, you need to write a specification, and, you know, formal method steps, or write a specification and you check the specification. So no, actually you can extract the specification from two pieces of code and compare them using a logic solver. And if there's a disagreement, that could be a way of finding a bug. So that's what I call differential analysis. And we did for, uh, this for input validation and we, we co compared client-side code with server-side code and we found uh, disagreements in the same application. Now you may say, why do you do both client-side and server-side check in an application? But this is standard in web applications. You do client-side check because you want to be responsive and you don't want to waste server's time. If it passes the client-side check, then you do another check on the server-side. Then you might say, why are you doing another side check on the server-side? Because the user could be malicious and may bypass the client side check and directly send you. So you need to recheck that the server side. And your server side check should always be stronger than your client side check because you can't trust the client ch side check. So now you have a generic policy that is not a special policy and we can check that for all applications. And I have this generic policy and I can do that differential analysis. So we, that was another um, check we did with, with this work. Um, now, uh, okay, I'll skip the experiments, but let me go to the very end of the experiment. So we did, you know, we applied this technique to some different tools, uh, but the biggest one I think we did at the time was this, uh, you know, whatever, some 8,000 lines of code and found vulnerabilities, found some false positives because we over approximate. And you may say, well, that's pretty bad false positive ratio. But we also tracked down what those false positives are. And, you know, path insensitivity was one because we were ignoring branches for that implementation which can be done and we have actually versions that uh, implement that now. And we couldn't model some actually functionality in the code, so we assumed worst case behavior and that caused some imprecision. But um, it could be theoretically, you, know, you can uh, extend the tool to handle these. But um, one thing is after we patched the vulnerabilities, we reused the tool and actually it didn't give any errors, right? So this is kind of a thing where you say, oh, you know, so I can actually check that uh, there are no uh, more uh, you know, sensation uh, problems. Now, okay, so there's a bunch of papers on this and we even have a book monograph on this string analysis uh, stuff. Um, but I wanna talk at least, you know, a little bit about these other things we did which are completely different areas. And, and, but it still kind of follows a similar pattern where we take a problem and kind of try to use constraint solvers uh, for it. Um, so one is I'll, I call um, data model verification, and um, so how much time do I have? And uh, three? Um, yeah. fifteen twenty minutes. Okay, yeah. sounds good. So one uh, one of the things I call is data model verification, and um, so this is about. Um, let me just go to this slide. So web applications, right? So we have the um, you know some web server and typically some database at the back end, some data store. And uh, you know, we have some clients, it could be desktop or it could be mobile client, and this is typical architecture. And what, when people write web application code, typically they use though, what they use is model view uh, controller architecture, right? So they have a kind of an architecture to way that this thing is written, and, um, and a lot of frameworks support this, and we worked on Rails, and this, Model view controller architectures typically use something called an object relational mapping. So they have some you know, object-oriented code that manipulates this data, but that is automatically translated to actually some uh, you know, relational database queries, and the data is stored in a database, okay? So 
this part is what we were interested in. You know, this checking properties about this data model, right? And if you look at the code of these things, um, so some Rails code, here is some uh, static data model. There's some user, there's project, there's to-do list. Um, if you look at it, it specifies something like that, to me, looks very much like an alloy model, all right, if you are familiar with alloy. So there is basically some user, you know, class, there's a set of users, there's a set of project, there's a set of to-dos, there's a set of nodes, and we have some associations between them. So, you know, user, project, and, you know, a project has many nodes. So there is an association between project and nodes, and a node belongs to a project. So that's the relation between those two classes. And so this is kind of what I call the static data model. And now you have some actions that do updates on that data, right? So this action, for example, uh, this, uh, apparently takes a, um, takes a project ID and actually deletes, I think, all the projects related to that. So finds the project that's related to that project ID and then first deletes each node of that project and then it deletes the project. So given a project ID, basically it deletes the nodes of that project and then deletes the project itself. So there's some update for that. So we were interested in verifying properties about this type of stuff. But now I'm not interested in the user interface about this. I'm only interested in this data model. So model view controller architecture by separating the view you know, from the model actually gives you some modularity and some abstraction that you can actually focus only on that part. And so that's what we did, and we automatically kind of extracted these uh, models from, uh, this is actual visualization of something we automatically extracted from this code, some data model. And um, what do you, you know, what kind of properties you may want to check about the stuff, for example, is it possible to have two accounts for one user? You know, does this data model allow that? Or is a book's, author, a book's author should be the same as the book's edition's author. So, you know, book edition as an author, book as an author. Deleting a should, or user should not create orphan users. So, uh, order, sorry. So there's a user, there are orders. So if I delete a user, I better first delete the orders associated by that user. So properties like that. So we were interested in this, and here's the flow from that. Again, like in the previous research I showed you, there is some model extraction part. So this is the part where we, from the code, extract the part we care about. And because I want to ignore all the other stuff that's going on that's too difficult for me to, or you know, not necessarily difficult, I'm not interested in it, right? So, so I, I extract that. And we did some property inference here because we wanted to automatically generate properties and that. Right? But then we have logic translation. So we are, again, in this case, it wasn't symbolic execution, uh, but you know, a different approach to do the logic translation. Uh, translation and then using some logic sorbels, you know, uh, for bot detection, and we also did some uh, data model, uh, model repair here, uh, based on the properties that we uh, ch were checking. Um, so, I want to <coughs> make uh, a couple of notes here. Model extraction is hard here because the, we were using on Rails, and there's a lot of dynamic behavior. Um, you know, the code is dynamically generated, so it's hard to analyze the code if it's dynamically generated. So we did something like um, we actually um, hijacked the runtime and kind of did a, uh, you know, we generated the model while executing the code. And uh, so this was done uh, by a PhD student of mine. And, um, and then we went to first order logic, uh, basically specification. And that was also has a bunch of things you need to do. For example, how you, do you deal with loops, if you have loops? Um, and we actually used quantification to capture the loops. And there's all sorts of details in there. Um, and eventually, we did what we call inductive verification. So given an you know, action in the web application, assuming all the invariants hold, and assuming that I execute this action, do all the invariants still hold after I execute the action? So we, d we look at one action at a time. So that actually gives you scalability, because now you can focus on one action at a time. And here are some results from that line of work where, um, you know, we looked at a bunch of the, I think these three applications here, but, you know, so some of them are pretty big here. Uh, like, <coughs> yeah, 30,000 lines of code. Already. And, um, and, you know, we can, it, it, just, it does take, um, you know, 
time. So it's like 40 seconds per action invariant pair in this case. Um, it does, we verified a bunch of things, we find some bugs, and in some cases we were inconclusive. So we couldn't say verified or falsified in this uh, verification effort. Uh, so this is basically, we are checking for each action does it preserve, preserve the invariant or not. And we found some bugs and you know, a few false positives too, but not too many false positives, but uh, some uh, you know, inconclusive results. Uh, and uh, we have a bunch of papers about that too. Um, now the final thing I wanna mention before I close, um, this, is, this was another interesting thing. Um, Amazon Web Services, um, they opened, you know, they announced a new tool, but this was a big problem for them, access control. So a lot of the news stories you hear about people, oh, data was exposed. Seven million users' data was exposed. This company's data was exposed. A lot of it is they put it on cloud. They don't set the access control rights correctly. So anybody who has an Amazon you know, web service account actually sees their data. And that's what the vulnerability is. And of course, Amazon is like, you know, look, set your access control right, but, but they don't. So, so now it's, it doesn't look good for Amazon, right? So, th so this is a problem. And, and, uh, but so they developed tools to handle this. But it turns out, you know, 10 years ago, I, with a graduate student of mine, we looked at this problem for XACML. And we said, yeah, if it, you know, XACML was, you know, XACML or XACML, we pronounce it, was popular at the time. It's an access control policy language. Uh, I mean, it was just coming out popular in the sense that it was popular that researchers were looking into it. Um, and it was complex as access control policies. We are like, we should try to automatically check this. So what we did is the following problem. We take two access control policies, and we wanted to check, given policy one, is it at least as strong as policy two? And we took that and used a Boolean SAT translation from giving two policies. We generate a Boolean satisfiable formula, where if the formula is satisfiable, we know that you know, P1 is not as strong as P2, okay? So we find a violation, right, inconsistency. And we implemented this, you know, and we implemented this XACML to SAT translation, and we wrote a couple of papers about it. Uh, and at the time, the graduate student who was working on it, I said, I stopped working on it because we couldn't find real XACML policies that are out there. It wasn't like we couldn't find, you know, uh, applications to apply this to. Companies were using it ex internally, but, you know, we, they, nobody shared with us. So we stopped working on it. Uh, and we did some stuff similar also in, uh, for Rails later on. But the interesting thing is, um, uh, a year ago, uh, Amazon uh, implemented a tool and uh, they used for their uh, access control policy language. And they pretty much do the same approach. When you take two, uh, they take two access control policy specifications and they generate an SMT formula that actually, you know, uh, to check if policy one is more uh, stronger than policy two or at least as strong as policy two. And this prevents you from, you know, writing properties. You don't have to write for properties. And uh, it does work. Uh, they had a little bit uh, of, um, with string constraints, it wasn't working well initially. And, uh, you know, um, they uh, used automata-based constraints, string constraint solving that, like, uh, that uh, I do in my lab. And uh, now this, uh, they actually integrated this tool. And actually, they, it is used in production. And a lot of companies are using it. And this is a big deal in my mind. And it's, this is like if somebody says, oh, you know, formal methods d does not work. I mean, it clearly works. <laughs> it's really in use. So it's not like, uh, you know, this is not just academic stuff and it uh, really uh, has impact. Um, so, so that was my summary of this thing. So, but now you may say, well, what was the secret sauce of this translation? So you talk a lot, but what is the secret sauce? So then let me just briefly summarize what I think it is. Um, look, finding bugs is hard. So first thing you need to do is focus your attention to particular class of bugs. And what does that mean? Actually, I think what we do is exactly <laughs> the same as the software design principles. We are doing abstraction, we are using exploiting modularity, and we are focusing, you know, we are exploiting separation of concerns. So if you are going to do input validation, separation of concerns, just look at input validation related stuff. 
uh, use modularity when you can. If model view controller architectures has some modularity, exploit that in your verification technique. You know, focus on that part. And use abstraction when you can, right? And, uh, and if you do that, you know, for, for example, um, you know, input validation, access control, data model, these are different concerns, so that helps. Uh, and overall, I think the secret sauce we have is a three-step process. Using modularity, separation <laughs> of concerns, and abstraction principles, generate a model, right, which is not the code, but an abstraction of the code. And it's as simple as possible, but captures the problem, the dependability issue that you want to solve. Then translate questions about that model to a logic query and use a logic solver. If there isn't any logic solver for that logic that you are interested in, build one. And we have done that too. So, but that is, you know, that is a lot of logic solvers out there nowadays and you can uh, typically get that, um, you know, a lot of applications of that. So, so that's that. Um, and I would end here, uh, but I wanted to say a couple more things. There's always an elephant in the room in any CS talk nowadays. And what is the elephant in the room in any CS talk nowadays? It's machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> because somebody's like, why don't you use machine learning? And that's a very good question. <laughs> and I was t talking uh, with my colleague, Tim Sherwood, about some time at, uh, you know, about this like machine learning and we use logic and he uses uh, also logic solvers and stuff. And um, you know, how does it fit? How does it fit? And he mentioned a book to me as like, do you know about this book? Go read this book. So there is a Nobel laureate uh, um, in, economics, or in economics, I think, Daniel Kahneman. And he has a famous theory where he says intelligence, human intelligence, has two separate components. One is system one, fast and in instinctive and emotional thinking, OK? And this is the system you use, for example, when you are driving on an empty road. You don't think. You, you don't think you are thinking, but you're thinking, but it's this instinctual thing. And when you ask somebody asks you two plus two, you say four, you don't, you don't think. But then there is another one, type two intelligence, which actually is very slow, deliberate, and if you are you know, buying a new laptop and you want to compare the memory and stuff, you're going to think, you're know, going to look at the numbers, add them up, whatever, so use that. Or if I ask you 17 times 24, you're not, you know, you're, maybe you know, some talented people do so. <laughs> but anyway, so you, there is some questions where you're not instinctively answered. And I think that's exactly the same situation we have with artificial intelligence. Because if you go back into the artificial intelligence research, if you go back, you'll see that a lot of it, when I was doing my PhD, was actually logic solvers and automated reasoning was logic inference. And that is what AI meant at that time because machine learning was not there yet. And, and so that was also origin of it. So eventually I think, you know, I'm not an artificial intelligence, intelligence researcher, I'm not an AI researcher, but what I'm saying is formal logic reasoning, logic re, uh, inference is going to be there and it's going to be an important uh, engine, inference engine that we will use. And the question is, you know, both of them going to be used. And the very interesting research problem is how to integrate them together. But if you want some guarantee, <coughs> if you want some guarantees, you will probably use some logic reasoning uh, actually to get the guarantee. So I, I think, and there's I think some research actually going on nowadays uh, combining uh, how to do you know, machine learning together with uh, logic inference. And um, so, so my conclusion is that we are working on a great area, all of us software engineers, uh, and using automated logic solvers is, I think, you know, works. It's uh, and there are um, ways to make it work in uh, practice. I think with uh, you know using the principles of modularity, abstraction, and separation of concerns. And for future work, I'm very interested in now to you know combine this uh, logic reasoning with uh, probably machine learning techniques. Thank you very much. How do you address the recursive problem? You, you've abstracted a model from your input, and now you want to know, is my model a, an accurate uh, representation of the original situation? Oh, I'll, I'll write an uh, automatic <laughs> system for comparing them. <laughs> yeah, so that, that part actually, no. I mean, so I, um, that recursion, there are, okay, 
there are multiple ways of addressing that. One is you can, that extraction could be sound so that you actually guarantee it's always an over approximation. Uh, and that used to be the approach for a very long time. Uh, I think in my area of research we have given up on that because, because it's, it just causes a lot of false positives. And, um, and, and so cause I don't think people basically are, um, yeah, we will give up, but we will occasionally miss errors. That's the side effect you get. But we are okay with it as long as we are useful. So we don't generate just too many false positives. Uh, there's another thing, I mean, the abstraction problem and the specification is a separate issue because there's the abstraction of the thing you I'm checking, but then what is the specification that I'm trying to, uh, you know, check on the uh, abstracted model? That's another issue, and that is, yeah, you need to have a specification to check correctness against, and that could be manually written, and then, of course, then you can have the problem of, well, you can have an error in your specification rather than the model, you know, that you extracted. Um, so that's why differential analysis, when it's competitive, like I have two different code, right? I extract a model from one, I extract another model from another one, I compare them and I find a disagreement, and then I report that, so that is, there is no specification there. Now, the disagreement could be spurious. I mean, so again, false positives and false positives, uh, negatives are always, um, yeah, I mean, again, the problem is undecidable in general if you, <laughs> you know, push, push to the limits, so. shows how many, what percentage of false negatives or false positives right. do you get with a pro, with specific case of uh, uh, automated reasoning? Right. Because it, it is based on the, whichever domain it is applied. Yeah, so um, I, I am, I'm, so there are, I'll say I don't. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bad empirical uh, <laughs> software engineering researcher. Uh, I'm more on the formal method side. But I think there are uh, you know, excellent empirical engineering, uh, software engineering researchers who do study that. So, uh, but I, I feel like you know, we develop these techniques, we show feasibility, and we don't, uh, yeah, we show feasibility of that, you know, look, this can attack this problem, and now, for, you know, in the wild, for, you know, real developers, is it really going to work? So that's an extra level, another work, you know, uh, that needs to be done. Of course, you know, whenever we can do all of it, that would be great. But uh, it, there are a lot of uh, hurdles to that. I mean, first of all, sometimes, again, you know, when we were looking at access control, there wasn't any benchmark stuff. I mean, I couldn't get access to it. But I knew that this was an interesting problem, you know, and I knew that this would be a you know problem that should be addressed. And you know, ten years later, uh, they're like, oh, hey, you know, yeah, we are really solving real problems with a similar approach. And um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think it's, but it's it's a very important question you need to address if you really want to deliver it to the engineers, in the, you know, on the ground working on problems. So, so at some point, you need to address that. The, of course, the other issue is having a feedback loop. Right. With that information, but yeah, right, right. I, I guess I'm asking you to expand on your last answer. Early in your talk, you had a list, sort of a definition of dependability, listed a number of other properties. Do those properties come with formalism? You know, specifications of no. uh, maintainability or. Uh, right. So I have, I mean, so in my research, I picked problems that I can get to some formal characterization of what the property is, right? So, I mean, I'm not saying this is going to happen with everything, but um, for a lot of things, you know, the things that I attacked, um, you know, there is some specification you can come up with, um, and uh, so it, we can reduce it to some uh, logic problem. Uh, but I'm not saying that it's always the case. Uh, it, there may be problems that is, uh, yeah, may not be solved this way, but maybe for those problems, maybe we use machine learning. <laughs> uh, all right, so um, uh, before, so thank you again to uh, Tefik for the, for the great talk.